National Geographic. I seen Dante was when I had dropped my son off with his grandma and I didn't know that was gonna be the last time that I was gonna see him and I just felt like that's so wrong because now my son he don't have a dad his dad didn't get to see him for his second birthday or for any of his birthdays and I'm just so messed up about it because like, I feel like they stole my son's dad from him. More heartbreak and grief in Minnesota. Two families going through the same excruciating pain together in solidarity. George Floyd's family wanting to lend support to the loved ones of Dante Wright. Department shakeup two days after the death of Dante Wright, the police officer who fired that fatal shot has resigned, along with the chief of police in Brooklyn Center. Tonight, Minnesota is bracing for more protests. And just miles away, the prosecution in the murder trial of former officer Derek Chauvin resting their case. What comes next and when we could see a verdict. Vaccine setback. Tonight, the CDC and FDA recommend a pause in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after six cases of a rare blood clot. What does this mean if you've already had a shot? And will this increase vaccine hesitancy? A conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Is there a chance at all that the CDC says, well, this is a risk that we're willing to accept and, and they ultimately end the pause? It is certainly conceivable. Reimagining policing in America. What y'all did, what we did, is come together and make a positive out of a negative. The actor stepping up to encourage change and important conversations. And it's a story of bravery and resilience in the midst of a terrible genocide. Look at them. These are not rebels. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Hitting the pause button in the race to vaccinate, we begin with that potentially major setback today now that the CDC and FDA suspended the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. They are taking this pause while they investigate cases of a rare blood clot in six women out of the nearly 7 million doses administered. Tonight, there are questions as to how this will affect the overall vaccine rollout. Today, the president tried to assure everyone that we still have enough doses for all Americans to get vaccinated. And there are also questions tonight about vaccine hesitancy. Will this decision mean more people will opt to not get a dose of any vaccine at all? Our conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci is coming up. But first, Steve Osinsami leads us off with more on the decision to pause and what comes next. It's the COVID vaccine that promises strong protection with a single dose, an important tool for public health officials around the world. But tonight, the FDA is telling everyone to hold off using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. A very small number of women have come down with an extremely rare blood clot after getting the shot. This is a really rare event. If you look at what we know so far, there have been six out of the 6.85 million doses, which is less than one in a million. All six women were between 18 and 48 years old. They got sick about six to 13 days after getting vaccinated. The clots formed in veins of the sinus and prevented blood from draining out of the brain. One woman died, another is in critical condition. There's no evidence showing the vaccine caused the condition. And to be super clear, your chances of getting struck by lightning are nearly twice as high, one in half a million. But the FDA is warning anyone who got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the last three weeks to be on the lookout for severe headache, shortness of breath, abdominal or leg pain. And if you need treatment for a blood clot, they strongly suggest avoiding the commonly used blood thinner heparin, which they believe adds to the complications. Health officials say that these rare immune responses have only been seen in viral vector vaccines. Johnson & Johnson is one, AstraZeneca is another. Pfizer and Moderna use a different technology. Very quickly today, the federal government put a hold on using the shot at mass vaccination sites, and at least 48 states followed. The nation's governors tonight are beyond frustrated in a phone call at the White House, they questioned the wisdom of putting a hold on a vaccine over such small number of cases. The ability for governors to reinstill confidence after something like this is a hundred times harder than putting the pause on in the first place. 
People who've already gotten the shot are worried, and now there's more of a scramble. CVS and Walgreens, for example, are rescheduling their Johnson & Johnson appointments. I don't want to take any chance. You know, it's my body, and I, I want to be uh, safe. The president tonight is trying to reassure Americans that there will still be enough vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna. Late today, Pfizer announced that they now expect to deliver their 300 million doses about two weeks ahead of schedule. So there's enough vaccine that is oh, basically 100 percent unquestionable for every single solitary American. President says we have enough. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. Joining us now is President Biden's chief medical advisor and director of the National Institute of Advanced Infectious Diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this pause of Johnson & Johnson is certainly a significant step backwards for a vaccine that was advertised as an effective one-time shot. Help us to understand what caused the FDA and CDC to issue this pause recommendation. Well, what they had noticed in their observation of the potential of any adverse events, that there were six instances in women of a serious adverse event. Uh, I think the important thing to emphasize is that it is very rare. There were six women uh, out of the 6.85 million vaccinations of the J&J, &J, which means that it's less than one in a million. However, because of a feeling of wanting to be an abundance of caution, the CDC and the FDA decided to call a pause to take a look at this, examine it more carefully, and trying to see if they can get some greater insight into what is going on, as well as, importantly, to alert physicians on the outside who may see additional individuals, if there are additional individuals, who may come into the office with this syndrome of thrombosis with low platelets, which is referred to as thrombocytopenia, because the natural thing to do would be to treat those people with heparin. However, heparin being an anticoagulant is not indicated in these situations. In fact, it could make matters worse. And for people who recently got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, if they're nervous about this thrombosis or, or blood clots, what should they be on the lookout for? And what's the potential window for side effects? Well, this occurred between 6 and 13 days following the administration of the vaccine. So if women or anyone, I mean, it happens to be six women, but it's certainly conceivable that men could get this. But for the for the, for the purpose of what's going on right now, it was six women. But if people uh, have gotten vaccinated several weeks ago, it is extraordinarily unlikely that it will involve them because it is really within that bracket of one to two weeks. But if you had gotten vaccinated with the J&J &J in the past week or two, severe headache is one of them. Another is neurological abnormalities like difficulty moving arms and legs. People could even have seizures with this. They could have chest discomfort and difficulty breathing because they may have thrombosis in some of the pulmonary vessels. Abdominal pain is another thing that people would think about. And are the potential blood clot issues with the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines similar? And are you concerned that these more traditional vaccines could be leading to an immune response that causes the clots? Well, the uh, similarities between the description of the adverse event events in the J&J, &J, which we just discussed just now, and that with the AstraZeneca are very clear. The common denominator of the two is that they both use an adenovirus vector to deliver the gene and the expression of that gene of the coronavirus protein. So that is a clue that there may be a connection there, but that's what the CDC and the FDA are very carefully looking at right now. And as you say, as we try and keep some perspective here, six people out of seven million is extremely rare. There's actually a greater chance that you'd get struck by lightning. Is there a chance at all that the CDC says, well, this is a risk that we're willing to accept and, and they ultimately end the pause? It is certainly conceivable. That's the reason why you call it a pause. They're pausing, they're examining it, and then we'll find out hopefully within a reasonable period of time whether they'll come back and say continue because 
the benefit outweighs the risk, or they might modify the population who gets the vaccine, depending upon what their determination is. And switching gears here, let's take a look at Michigan. Cases are surging there. The governor has been begging for more vaccines. And I just have to ask, should the U.S. consider letting states like Michigan, who are dealing with surges, lengthen the time between the first and second shot? A real-world study from the CDC found both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are 80 percent effective after just one dose. So why not potentially allow states to vaccinate more people with the doses that they already have? Yeah, we've had many discussions about that. And one of the things that is very unclear is the durability of the effect if you prolong it and don't give the second dose for a considerable period of time. The other thing is that if you look at the level of antibody response with a single dose and compare it to that of two doses, it is dramatically higher. And particularly when you're dealing with variants You've got to be concerned that you want to get the optimal response. So obviously there's some merit in that determination, but all things considered, we feel the better part of Allo would be to get people as well protected as you possibly can and to vaccinate as many people as you possibly can. We've had the opportunity to have you on this show several times this past year, and each time you've expressed some concern that not enough Americans may get the vaccine. Are you now worried that this might uh, drive people who already might have been hesitant to decide not to get a shot at all? Well, I mean, obviously, that's, that is a concern. However, that's the reason why we're out there and being as open and transparent as we possibly can and articulating what we just said, that the risk is really minimum. The other thing that's important is that there have been about 120 million people who have received at least one vaccine dose. Uh, namely, uh, I would say there was uh, about 6.85 of that million is the J&J. &J. So that means there's about 115 million people who've received either the Moderna or the Pfizer. And there has been no uh, signal, no red flags at all of any serious adverse events. I think people need to realize that because if one in less than more than a million is a very rare event for the J&J, &J, that means that the mRNAs of Pfizer and Moderna are exceedingly safe. So people need to understand that and put it into perspective that although we always take adverse events seriously, in the big picture of things, the vaccines are extremely safe. And we just have to keep telling people that and showing them the data that proves it, not just telling them that. Look at the numbers. Well, we appreciate your transparency and you talking with us, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Appreciate your insight. Thank you. On to Minneapolis now, from the courtroom to the courtyards. Emotions in Minnesota are high and people are on edge as protesters, many of the mothers, continue to demand justice for Dante Wright in the shadow of the George Floyd trial. All the while, an interim police chief is still trying to piece together exactly what happened. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is in Brooklyn Center for us. Tonight, the officer who fatally shot Dante Wright has resigned from the force. We have received a resignation a letter. In that letter, Officer Kim Potter writing, I believe it is in the best interest of the community, the department, and my fellow officers if I resign immediately. We now know that Potter had been with the Brooklyn Center Police Department for 26 years. And during that fatal traffic stop, she was training another officer. The mayor of Brooklyn Center also announcing today that the police chief has stepped down. An acting police chief now in place. There's just a lot of chaos going on right now. We're just trying to wrap our heads around the situation and try and create some calm. But overnight, the protests continued nationwide. More than 50 arrests made in Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center. And you yourself went out there last night. You went out there with protesters. What was that like? It was very tense. Where I was, uh, they were protesting peacefully. They were certainly uh, angry at uh, the, the situation. And among the family of Dante Wright, there's also shock and disbelief over his death. The police say she accidentally grabbed the gun instead of the taser. So you don't accidentally grab something, point it at them, not realize what you have in your hands. It's just not true. Dante's parents doubting this was an accidental shooting this morning in an interview with ABC's Robin Roberts. 
Do you accept that explanation, Mr. Wright? I cannot accept that. I lost my son. He's never coming back. This officer that's been on the force for 26 plus, 26 years. I can't accept that. I would like to see justice served and her held accountable for everything that she's taken from us. The family of Dante Wright is now represented by attorney Benjamin Crump. Say his name! Dante Wright! He also represents the family of George Floyd. Outside the courthouse, where former officer Derek Chauvin is standing trial, the Floyd family uniting with the Wright family, calling for change. At some point, we need officers to be held accountable, Amen. charged, Amen. and convicted. Amen. Just because you are the law don't mean that you're above the law. Those calls for justice increasing. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, what's the latest on whether or not any charges will be brought against Officer Potter? So, Lindsay, the Washington County attorney says he will review all of the evidence given to him by the state investigative unit and hopes to make a decision on charges against Officer Kim Potter tomorrow. Lindsay? And also that officer submitted her resignation today. The mayor, though, leaving his options open. Exactly. So we spoke with the mayor uh, this afternoon and he said that even though Officer Potter submitted her letter of resignation, they are still evaluating the process. They're evaluating all of the evidence. So uh, he is not ruling out the possibility of actually firing Officer Potter. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. And now to the trial that's happening just a few miles away of former officer Derek Chauvin. The prosecution resting their case today as the defense calls its first witness to say that Chauvin's actions were justified that day. Alex Perez reports in again from Minneapolis. After a dozen law enforcement witnesses testified former police officer Derek Chauvin used excessive force against George Floyd, today for the first time a police veteran testifying Chauvin's actions were justified. Now, are there situations where a reasonable police officer would not put a person in the prone position into the recovery position? So in this situation, there is space limitations. Mr. Floyd was butted up against the tire of the patrol car. Um, there was traffic still driving down the street. Um, there were crowd issues that took the attention of the officers. Um, Mr. Floyd was still somewhat resisting. So I think those were relatively valid reasons to keep him in the prone. The defense calling former officer Barry Broad as a use of force expert. I felt that Officer Chauvin's interactions with Mr. Floyd were following his training, following current practices in policing, and were objectively reasonable. In fact, Broad testifying that Chauvin didn't actually use force at all when he pinned Floyd down. The maintaining of the prone control to me is not a use of force. Why is it not a use of force? Because it's a control technique without, it, it doesn't hurt. But the prosecutor pushing back, showing this picture, Chauvin with his knee on Floyd's neck. I need to ask you if you believe that it is unlikely that orienting yourself on top of a person on the pavement with both legs is unlikely to produce pain? It could. What do you mean it could? Is it unlikely to produce pain or is it likely to produce pain? I'm saying it could produce pain. If this act that we're looking at here in Exhibit 17 could produce pain, would you agree that what we're seeing here is a use of force? Shown in this picture, that could be a use of force. Raise your right hand. The jury today also hearing for the first time from an officer who responded to the scene, Peter Chang of the Minneapolis Park Police, who showed up to assist and watched from across the street. We'll figure things out, right? Right now, we're grabbing an ambulance for your buddy, for Florida, okay? The defense arguing the officers felt threatened by the crowd. The crowd was becoming more loud and aggressive. A lot of yelling across the street. Did that cause you any concern? Uh, concern for the officer's safety, yes. Officer Chang's body camera capturing George Floyd sitting on the ground. Last name? Floyd. 
The defense, which has focused on Floyd's drug use before the encounter with police, also calling a woman who was with him at the time, Shawanda Hill, testifying Floyd had nodded off in the car and she tried several times to wake him up when the police arrived. He instantly grabbed the wheel and he was like, please, please don't kill me. Please, please don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. What did I do? Just tell me what I did. Shawanda Hill giving her account of Floyd's final moments. Alex Perez joins us now from Minneapolis. And Alex, the defense expected to wrap its case this week. And right now, there's no indication that Derek Chauvin will take the stand himself. Hey, Lindsay, yeah, the defense is moving through witnesses very quickly, but at this point, we have no reason to believe that Derek Chauvin would take the stand. But you have to remember, for the defense, they just have to inject enough reasonable doubt into this case to convince one juror. Um, we're expecting they will rest their case at some point this week. As you said, and closing arguments would then begin on Monday, Lindsay. And Alex, we've been hearing for weeks that Chauvin is guilty by many of the people who've given their testimony. Today was the first day that we heard a witness say Chauvin's actions were just justified. Yeah, Lindsay, and the jury was listening closely to all of this, uh, taking notes as they heard this testimony from this use of force expert. It was uh, quite an afternoon of testimony inside the courtroom. That cross-examination by the prosecutor actually lasted much longer than the direct examination by the defense of their own witness. Uh, while he was on the witness stand, there were several times that he sort of backtracked and had to correct himself. It was certainly something that the jury was listening to as all this played out. Um, um, uh, clearly, the jury will have a lot to weigh once they finally get back into that uh, deliberation room, Lindsay. Alex Perez for us outside of the courthouse in Minneapolis. And for more analysis now of the trial, we're joined again by ABC News contributor and host of the Law and Crime Network, Mr. Brian Buckmeyer. Thanks, as always, Brian. Uh, the prosecution rested its case today. Take me a step back. How well would you say that they presented their side over the past two weeks? And, and what moments do you think are likely to stick with jurors? And the prosecution did a fabulous job in their case. They not only put forward their evidence that they wanted to prove, but also closed off a lot of the avenues that the defense might try to wiggle out of to find reasonable doubt. Some of the highlights I think they're going to point to are Chief Arredondo, who testified about the policies and use of force, Dr. Tobin, who was captivating even to the defense attorney, and of course, Flonis Floyd, the spark of life witness, who gave such impassioned testimony about his brother. And George Floyd's friend, Shawanda Hill, described Floyd just before his arrest. Take a listen. How would you describe Mr. Floyd's behavior while inside of the cup foods? Happy, normal, talking, alert. They get into a car. She says that Floyd fell asleep. What was the defense trying to achieve by calling Ms. Hill? And do you think that her testimony did them any favors? So in previous testimony, we heard that fentanyl has the ability to slow down a person's heart rate, to have them turn to someone who's a little bit sleepier and not as excitable as they might be on other drugs. And I think Eric Nelson is trying to get that sleepiness to contrast uh, other testimony that George Floyd was up and about and running around. However, the testimony that we saw from Ms. Hill was a little bit hard for the de defense to swallow because we heard things like, well, he told me that uh, he, being George Floyd, had worked a long day the day before. But the judge oh, struck though that, though. Didn't he, didn't he tell the jury to strike that? Yeah, but defense attorneys and prosecutors will all tell you the same thing, that a bell can't be unwritten. Yeah. Or unwrung, sorry. So once it's said, yeah, sure, you can tell jurors to not remember it or not think about it, but it definitely will be in their head. It will definitely come up during deliberation, and it's definitely going to hurt the defense. And defense attorney Eric Nelson tried to paint George Floyd and the gathering crowd as aggressive through the testimony and body camera footage of Officer Chang. Do you think that that was persuasive, especially as we see here Floyd appearing calm and cooperative. I don't think it was persuasive at all, and I think the prosecution handled it very well. I think what we saw was that Officer Chang was paying attention to the two individuals who were passengers in George Floyd's car, and they were able to move around. They were able to see, we can even see Miss Hill moving to the corner and trying to look over to see what's happening to George Floyd. If Officer Chang truly believed or is truly concerned for those officers' safety, then I think the question becomes, why didn't he call for backup? Why didn't he go and check on them? He obviously was not containing these two passengers to one location. 
question. So I think that argument kind of falls flat. As well as Derek Chauvin's hand in his pocket, I, I was surprised that we didn't hear more about that because it seems like if you were feeling threatened that you wouldn't keep your hand pretty steadily in your pocket. But lastly, I want to ask you, the defense also brought up George Floyd's prior arrest in May of 2019, a year before his fatal police encounter. What do you think that the jury took away from this evidence, and, and was this a smart move by the defense? So I think the jury took away from it that in 2019, George Floyd took drugs and was arrested, and surprise, surprise, he didn't die. He received medical attention, and he lived for all of 2019. In May of 2020, the one major difference is Derek Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck. And so I think they're going to take that from that testimony. But I don't think it was persuasive, because I think while both the defense and prosecution has been trying to take race out of this conversation, out of this case, it does keep coming back very subtly. I think Eric Nelson is trying to push this idea that George Floyd is a stereotypical big, scary black man on drugs, and this small 140-pound officer had to use this level of force against him. But that, I think, is a myth that many in the jury are not going to uh, appreciate or uh, take kindly to. Brian Buckmeyer, appreciate your insight. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And when we come back, the island buried in ash, another new eruption, the latest on the crisis on one Caribbean island. The major announcement and the fierce blowback President Biden set to declare all American troops will be out of Afghanistan by 9-11. But up next, it was a story etched into Hollywood lore in the movie Hotel Rwanda, one man credited with saving hundreds from genocide. Tonight, he is behind bars, accused of being a terrorist. It's a story you will not want to miss. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back. You may recall the 2004 blockbuster Hotel Rwanda about real-life hero Paul Rusesa Bagina, who at the height of the Rwandan genocide reportedly helped save more than 1,000 people when they took shelter at a hotel where he was the manager. Now, nearly 20 years after that movie came out, Paul is back in Rwanda, but this time in jail and charged with more than a dozen terror-related offenses. If convicted, he could spend the rest of his life in prison. So exactly how did Rwanda's 
hero end up behind bars? ABC's Maggie Ruley has this story. It's a story of heroism in the midst of a brutal genocide that became immortalized by Hollywood. Don Cheadle playing the real life Paul Rusesabagina in Hotel Rwanda. Look at them. These are not rebels. Soon they will be worthless to you. Why not take some money for your work? How much? The Oscar nominated movie showing how Paul apparently helped more than a thousand people take shelter in Hotel de Mikulin during Rwanda's darkest days. The 1994 genocide, where in just 100 terrifying and violent days, nearly one million ethnic Tutsis were killed by Hutu extremists. After the movie's release, Paul quickly ascended to fame, giving highly paid speeches around the world, even receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Without that shelter, every one of them would almost surely have been killed. But real life is often messier than it looks on the big screen. And now the man who was once the darling of the international community has found himself behind bars in his home country, fighting for his reputation and freedom. Uh, Begina very early on was uh, collaborating with uh, groups that committed genocide here in 94 and that escaped to Congo. The FDLR, the evidence against him is overwhelming. Rwandan prosecutors have charged him with 13 terror-related offenses, including financing terrorists, complicity in murder, and forming a rebel group. Paul has maintained his innocence. The understanding has always been that these allegations against Paul are linked to his criticism of the regime that's in power in Rwanda. Paul, who's a permanent U.S. resident and whose family lives in San Antonio, alleges he was kidnapped by Rwandan authorities back in August, something Rwanda's president vehemently denies. There was no kidnap, there was no any wrongdoing uh, in the process of his getting here. Paul claims he was tricked by a pastor into boarding a private jet while transiting to Dubai, thinking he was going to speak at churches in Burundi. We said I'm going to speak to speeches as to, to churches, and I didn't think too much into it because my dad, my dad has spoken to uh, churches in the past. Instead, the plane landed in Rwanda, where he was promptly arrested. He's being held in a cell that doesn't have a window. He's held in that cell for 22 and a half hours per day. If it's raining, he's in there for 24 hours. He has no access to his legal documents. He has no access to his case file. Human Rights Watch says his arrest amounted to an enforced disappearance, a serious violation of international law. In recent years, Paul's become an outspoken critic of the Rwandan government, and some of his luster has faded. Paul's family is now trying to remind the international community of his legacy and the injustices he's facing. This is a sham trial. If you're a dissident in Rwanda, you can go to jail, you can get imprisoned, you know, you can get killed. And on top of that, my father has a platform that President Kagame doesn't like. You know, my father has been able to tell the world that, that has, has had the chance to tell the world about what happens in Rwanda. Rwandan strongman president Paul Kagame is often called the darling tyrant. The U.S. is one of his staunchest allies and oldest supporters. And some credit him with turning the country into an economic powerhouse for the region in the years after the genocide. But President Kagame has been consolidating power now for decades and is known for sniffing out his enemies. People, people, people. Paul Rusesabagina's adoptive daughter, Anais, whose biological parents died in the genocide, believes that ever since the 2004 film came out, President Kagame has had a personal vendetta against her father. When my father received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Kagame also increased his attacks on him. He, we, our house got broken up several times. Uh, my father had to wear a bulletproof jacket every time he had to give a speech. Paul's lawyers say he isn't getting a fair trial in Rwanda and that his fate is already sealed. He'll likely be convicted. But the scars of the Rwandan genocide are omnipresent. Almost everything in daily life ties back to it, and Paul's trial is no different. Since Paul's name has resurfaced, so have the memories of some genocide survivors who question Hollywood's heroic portrayal of the former hotel manager. Yes, yes. He cut off our means of communication. 
especially the fax machine that we used to communicate with the outside world. Because we were in distress, we would send messages so we could get help and also tell the international community what was going on. At one point, they asked us for money. They were given instructions that whomever wasn't able to pay would need to leave the hotel. And since I had a check on me, I gave them one. Zozo worked for Paul at the hotel and recounts similar instances. Paul says he protected people. It's a lie. I have many examples. If you didn't have money, he wouldn't let you stay at the hotel. Either you gave him a check or you paid cash. Instead of protecting people, he made it a business. Others who had hid at the hotel say they didn't even know who Paul was. The name Paul Rusesabagina, I only heard it when the movie came out and everyone started talking about it. I never heard of him when I was at the hotel. In fact, the Rwandan government claims the reason Hotel de Colin was spared had nothing to do with Paul at all. France asked the government uh, that was carrying out the genocide not to kill people in uh, Minicolin. It is written in uh, documents, uh, French documents. Yeah, it's very clear. Paul's trial is expected to last several more months. And while some in Rwanda can't garner sympathy for him, Paul's family is pleading for the international community's help. He believes in uh, human rights. He believes in principles and in the law, you know, in justice. It encourages me even more to bring him back and to fight for his release because we're on the side of the truth. Maggie Ruley for ABC News. Our thanks to Maggie for bringing that story to us. And still ahead here on Prime, the college student who vanished without a trace 25 years ago from an off-campus frat party in California. Tonight, police announce a major break in that case. Escalating tensions, Iran's new promise after a blackout potentially crippled one of their underground nuclear facilities. And a major movie theater chain is shutting its doors. What does it say about that industry? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, a former CDC head reminding everyone we are still in a life or death struggle against COVID. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. The betrayal was just unimaginable. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. There's one more huge twist. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. We're talking with Oscar nominees, A-listers, and insiders about everything. Inside the Oscars. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. 
Welcome back, everyone. And now to news that is sending shockwaves through Hollywood and beyond. The iconic arc light cinemas and Pacific theaters are closing down for good after months of losing business during the pandemic. We take a closer look by the numbers. Pacific Theaters operates about 300 screens in California, including the historic Cinerama Dome, which has towered 75 feet over Sunset Boulevard since 1963. The LA landmark has appeared in numerous films, including Quentin Tarantino's 2019 movie movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and hosted some of the biggest budget movie premieres. Also shuttering is the Arclight Hollywood, which opened in 2002. It was the first of the Arclight chain and introduced the concept of reserved movie theater seating and also ushers. The entire industry has just been pummeled. Movie theater ticket sales plunged 81% in 2020 in the U.S. and Canada. Meanwhile, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the market for home and mobile entertainment shot up 21% last year according to the National Association of Theater Owners. In a statement to ABC News, Pacific Theater said closing was, quote, not the outcome anyone wanted, but despite a huge effort that exhausted all potential options, the company does not have a viable way forward. For Tinseltown, this is certainly the end of an era. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. 20 years after 9-11, President Biden is announcing all troops will be leaving Afghanistan. Many are asking, why now? And with so much debate about policing in America, our conversation about how some say it should look in certain communities. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. It's such a bizarre story. Sometimes I don't even believe that it happened to me. The betrayal was just unimaginable. I don't even have words for that kind of evil. I've written over 30 crime novels, but this story, it baffles me. Here's the thing, we as human beings think that no one can really read us, but we kind of can read other people. The more we think that, the more we get it wrong. The devil never sleeps. Is the man still in your house? Yes, he's laying there on the floor with a bullet in his head. Did you shoot him? Yes, I shot him. He was killing my wife. When they arrived, they found a very grisly scene. There was no signs of forced entry. Winger said he found Harrington beating his wife with a hammer, and to save her, he shot Harrington twice in the head. The detectives came to the conclusion that Mark Winger acted in self-defense, and the case was closed within approximately 48 hours. It all fit pretty good. In fact, almost too good. And in comes this young, beautiful nanny who wants to help out this poor man. Tell Grandma how you stand in your crib. And it was my purpose to make this family whole again. Mark and I eloped. We went to Maui. Now they're going to Hawaii and getting married? Like, seriously? Can I say it on camera? What the f I'm sorry, but seriously. There's something going on here that we missed. Was this the moment when Mark went from thinking about murder, maybe even fantasizing about murder, and realized, I can maybe pull it off? I never thought my husband was a diabolical murderer. Now Friday night, new interviews, stunning details. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This is just taking a turn for the surreal. The all-new 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. The devil never sleeps. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. The police officer who claims she mistakenly pulled her gun instead of a taser on Dante Wright, killing him, has resigned. So has the chief of police. We have received a resignation, a letter from Officer Kim Porter. Put her in jail. Yeah. Like they would do any one of us. The Wright family angry and distraught. Their attorneys saying this didn't have to happen. It was intentional they stopped him. It was intentional they used the most force. Uh -huh. 
They could have gave him a ticket. Wright's mother spoke on Good Morning America. I know my son was scared. <laughs> He's afraid of the police. <laughs> And I just seen and heard the fear in his voice, but I don't know why. And it should have never, ever escalated the way it did. Following the shooting, protesters took to the streets. Several businesses were damaged and some officers hurt. The unrest just 10 miles away from where the former Minneapolis police officer is on trial for the death of George Floyd. The defense is now presenting its case in Derek Chauvin's murder trial. Attorneys for Chauvin called defense training experts trying to raise doubt in the prosecution's case that George Floyd died from lack of oxygen due to Chauvin's actions. Shawanda Hill, who was in the vehicle with Floyd on May 25th, 2020, when he was approached by police. Other than being sleepy or nodding off a little bit, they seem abnormal to anything like that. The FDA has paused the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine due to six reported cases of rare blood clotting. The agency will conduct a review. White House Chief Medical Advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci says the majority of people who received the J&J shot should not worry. I think this is an unusual occurrence of a serious adverse event that you want to make sure before you go forward, you investigate it thoroughly. And that's exactly what they're doing. Someone who maybe had it a month or two ago would say, what is this mean for me? It really doesn't mean anything. You're okay. President Biden was asked about the pause of the J&J shot, saying the U.S. has a surplus of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. There's enough vaccine that is basically 100% unquestionable for every single solitary American. Two people now arrested in the 1996 disappearance of college student Kristen Smart. According to the Associated Press, the prime suspect in the case, Paul Flores, and his father, Ruben, were taken into custody this morning. And Flores was the last person seen with Smart before she disappeared. She was walking back to her dorm after a college party in California. For 25 years, Flores has been the prime suspect. Officials executed a search warrant on his dad's property last month. Iran now says starting tomorrow, it will begin enriching uranium up to 60% purity. That puts it a short step away from weapons grade. That is for Iran needs in the, to produce uh, certain uh, radio uh, isotopes needed for, uh, you know, certain uh, medical treatments. The move comes just days after an attack on a key Iranian nuclear facility, an attack Iran blames on Israel. Spotify announcing the limited release of its car thing. That's what they're calling it. The $80 car thing is the music streaming giant's take on a hands-free listening experience. It has a touch screen, a dial, and can be controlled with the phrase, Hey Spotify. The device can connect via Bluetooth, USB, or aux jack. A potentially useful option for those with a car lacking support for Apple's CarPlay or Android Auto. Want your own car thing? It's free for a limited time. Just join the wait list. Singer MIA took to Instagram today with a heartfelt post asking her fans to help the people of the island of St. Vincent via a GoFundMe page that she has set up. Her post read in part, as you may know, St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been very close to my heart. I wrote my first song there since going to Sri Lanka is out of the question for political reasons. It's been my island away from my island for the last 20 years. She went on to say that the devastation caused by the volcano is unlike anything the island has seen in decades. ABC's Victor Victor Akendo brings us the latest on this natural disaster in the Caribbean. St. Vincent's powerful La Soufriere volcano firing ash and hot gas into the sky again Tuesday. A reminder for those refusing to evacuate the red zone closest to the volcano, this threat is far from over. It is over time for you to leave. It is highly dangerous to your health. Explosive eruptions rocking the island since Friday with more expected in the coming days. Satellite images showing the massive eruptions from space. The series of eruptions leaving roofs like this demolished. These side-by-side -side videos captured on the same St. Vincent Road just three months apart showing the stark difference between the once sunny tropical island and its now ominous ash-filled sky. This volcano spewing a high-speed hot river of noxious gas, ash and rocks, sometimes traveling as fast as 400 miles per hour even more dangerous than slower creeping lava. There are very few structures in the world that could stand up 
to the forces of that material going down mountains. I, I, I shudder to think of if any living creatures was on that mountain. Plumes reaching as far as Barbados, 110 miles east of St. Vincent. Uh, it's been raining on and off in Barbados since last night, but it's not raining water. It's raining like a mud, like ash and water combined. Nearly 4,000 people are seeking refuge across the 87 shelters set up on St. Vincent. Though today, government officials advise the Carnival and Royal Caribbean cruise ships standing by, ready to transport residents to safety, that there was no immediate need for evacuation. Meanwhile, officials are closely watching another eruption in a tourist hotspot, Iceland. New images of tourists crowding around the active volcano there. It's just 25 miles from the capital of Reykjavik, the last eruption lasting 30 years. The destination popular with American tourists because vaccinated visitors don't have to quarantine. And in Hawaii, residents on edge after 34 earthquakes rocked Mount Loa, the world's largest volcano, on Sunday. Scientists warning an eruption could be imminent, requesting residents have their go bags packed and ready. Experts say while all this volcanic activity is noteworthy, it isn't uncommon. There are thousands of volcanoes around the world. Every one of them erupts relatively often. Most of the time, there's an active eruption somewhere in the world. So the fact that there's two or three at the same time, coincidence. Our thanks to Victor for that. It is the longest war in American history, and President Biden has just signaled its end date. The plan is reportedly that on the 20th anniversary of the horrific attacks of September 11th, all U.S. troops will be gone out of Afghanistan. Biden is said to make that declaration, but it does come with risks. Martha Raddatz has more. It will be 20 years in October since the U.S. launched those first airstrikes on al-Qaeda targets in Afghanistan. And tomorrow, President Biden will announce the 2,500 U.S. troops still there will be home by the 9-11 anniversary. President Trump had hoped to bring all the troops home by the start of next month after a tenuous agreement with the Taliban. But some military and civilian officials pushed for a few months longer. More than 2,400 American lives have been lost in the war, along with more than 40,000 civilians. Through dozens of trips on the ground, through the mountains, and with Air Force fighter pilots providing cover and support, we saw the conflict up close and the number of troops at the peak swelling to 100,000. But the Taliban continues to fight on. Martha Raditz joins us now. Martha, 20 years and the Taliban is still a threat. You have been to the region many times during the war. How will this be received in the military, especially if we leave without a clear win? Well, I, I think some in the military think it's too early, but others will probably applaud it. We have been, as you said, 20 years, 20 years. You know, Lindsay, more than 800,000 American service members and civilians have served in Afghanistan. So I think many think it's time to leave. September 11th, still several months away. And as you know, some in Congress are already pushing back against this withdrawal. Former President Trump, as you reported, kept pushing back his timeline. Could Biden backtrack, too? I, I suppose he could, but I think he has made very clear this is not conditions-based. In other words, if, if things really take a terrible turn over there, he's not going to look at that as conditions-based. He says he's still going to leave. The war is over, says President Biden. Martha Raddatz, thanks so much. And when we come back, building a police force trusted by all. But what does that take? Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline.
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Welcome back. The conversation about safety and good policing has become an increasingly contentious one. From local police departments to protesters on the streets, the discussion on how to bring about change and trust is ongoing. And that's where Emmy-nominated actor Michael K. Williams sees an opportunity for his organization, Crew Count, to not only change the conversation, but help community members take their passions to the polls. Janae Norman reports on the group's new agenda for public safety. What up, what up, what up, what up? In New York City, actor Michael K. Williams meets with a group of teen activists working for change on their streets. What y'all did, what we did, is come together and make a positive out of a negative. You'll realize that, right? We, we, yeah. we made a positive out of a negative. We're creating a movement right now. Williams is a co-founder and advocate for Crew Count, a community-led organization working to empower over-policed communities since fall of 2020. This whole thing really started because Operation Crew Cut basically purged the gang database because there's so many people up there that's not actually gang members that got added on because of a skull or the colors that they wear or who they associate themselves with. You don't even know if you're on the database or not. Yeah, and that's just get put on. How you just put me on a database I don't even know about? So they decided to do something about it. The young kids, the youth, like, we're not taking it no more. You know what I'm saying? Like, enough is enough. We know where we stand. We know what's going on. We see what's going on, and we're here to make a change. Hosting block parties to improve civic engagement in their neighborhoods. And the way we do that is by educating ourselves. Our youth is showing me the importance of voting and who to vote for, more importantly. Who count? It educated me a lot about the importance of voting and, like, different positions you could vote for, like different elected officials. Mm -hmm. So you could, like, I didn't know you could vote for certain jobs in the city, throughout the city, like the council members, the yeah. DA and stuff like that. I didn't know you could vote for those people. <laughs> Let's get people in political places to start breaking down these infrastructures and changing it to work for the way we need it to work for us. But, but, but that's, but having said that now, we gotta acknowledge that it is not about us warring against the police department and it's not about really the word abolishing is a is a strong word that's vague it's about a reconstruction because we need good police crew count believes the key to change is transforming the political landscape within their city and they're working directly with leaders to make that happen we made a pledge for the mayoral candidates that's running for Mayor, what we do is that we try to meet with them and we give each of them the pledge and this is something measurable that we can hold them accountable for. You know what I love the most about Crew Count? Is that we are going into the same communities that have been over-policed mm -hmm. and we are reaching out to the same people, the same young people that are being put on these gang databases and we are educating them and they are being activated. Their hope that their model can ripple well beyond their own block and positively impact other communities. What do y'all see Crew Count doing? What would you like to see Crew Count go? 
Everywhere. Everywhere. I would like right? to see everywhere. Poop County worldwide. City. We build the block worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. City by city. City by city, yeah, yeah. city yeah. block by block. You about to say right Country now this Poop County LYC. They don't know. It's like Poop County LA, Atlanta. Poop County Miami. Poop County Detroit. Poop County Chicago. Everywhere in Chicago. You get me, bro. You get me, bro. You can do a Poop County UK. Janae Norman, ABC News, New York. Block by block, city by city, our thanks to Janae for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Paying tribute, Officer William Billy Evans lying in honor in the rotunda after he was killed when a man rammed his car into a security barricade at the Capitol. The president delivered the eulogy, bringing up his own struggles with loss. But it was this moment. The president got out of his seat, handed that little Capitol toy dome back to the daughter of the fallen soldier that moved so many. Evans is the second Capitol officer to lie in honor this year, following Officer Brian Sicknick, who died after the January 6th attack. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us and have a great night.